Iran is a good example of a non-democratic regime. Uh, <clears throat> we will talk about Iran in the next lecture, we'll talk about China as another example. So let's talk about Iran first. Iran, first of all, they're not, um, it's not an Arabic uh, country. Uh, they are not, Iranians are not Arabs. So that's the first thing you need to know. They're Persians. Persia is one of the oldest civilizations that the humankind has, uh, you know, uh, had. Uh, which has dominated politically and culturally the uh, uh, Central Asia, Middle East for, for uh, well, hundreds of years, thousands even. Uh, so this is a long and uh, worthy culture. So that's one thing you need to know. They're not Arabs and that, that still remains uh, it's an important thing. Second is the advent of Islam, of course. Right? Islam gets in that area starts around the 7th century AD. Well, again, by this time the Persian Empire was long gone, but remember the Persian Empire existed for thousands of years right? before that. Um, so uh, the Persian Empire is long gone, but not the Persian culture. So when Muhammad dies and Islam spreads, it gets to the, this area where Persian culture was still around, literature, poetry, art, everything. Uh, and there is a clash here because, um, you know, Islam was harsher than, um, in the sense, you know, ethics, you know, some demands, for example, don't paint uh, pictures of, uh, you know, it's very strict requirements, uh, just like, you know, for example, Calvin or Luther, the reformers who had, you know, they, they banned all icons, you know, all religious painting, you know, they smashed the, the statues in churches, uh, Luther's followers and Calvin's and so on. Same with Islam, there was a clash. But that's important because there's a tension that will remain. And um, so that's another thing. Now, the, th the, the next important thing is that uh, uh, it gets there and does take over. It has a tremendous success. Islam spread like wildfire when it, it came about because it, was, it came about in, a state, in, a, in an area that was very... Um, there was no uh, set uh, culture religious or political in that area. There was no political um, uh, center of power, there was no cultural center of power. It was in between empires in, in the 7th century. And by the way, at that time Europe was, there was no, literally there was no strong culture anywhere or political organization. Uh, Europe was in the, um, in the state of um, disorganization after the fall of the Roman Empire. So it's a, it's a fertile ground to bring in a new, a new you know, model, right? A new system of order. You know, in chaos, this is where you make order, right? So, uh, what happens is that what's important to understand is that Muhammad, right, the founder of Islam, uh, what what was his role? His role was both of a prophet, meaning a religious leader, model, um, model and and messenger, right, from God, and also a political uh, community social leader, right? So that's very important that in, during Muhammad's time he was both, he governed his community both, um, there is no separation between spiritual and political, this worldly and that worldly in Islam, you know, that's the point. That Islam is a, is a program that tells you what's right, what's wrong, and you have to live your life according to that. Um, because once you know what's right and wrong, I mean, how can you not do that, right? So that applies to personal life, family life, social life, uh, and politics, because these are not separate, you know. Um, as you might have now understood after studying some political philosophy. Uh, you can't uh, separate these. So, well, but Muhammad was the prophet and the messenger of God, so what happens when he dies? That's the big question. Because when he dies, there's no one who is similarly a messenger or prophet. So there are various answers that are given by the community of those who followed him at the beginning, and it was a huge, tremendously successful, as I said, it spread like wildfire. Um, and one of the answers was, no, no, uh, the people who follow Muhammad, in order to be really, um, uh, to keep this, this dual position of, of uh, rulers appointed by God, who are both rulers of our spiritual, spiritual guides and political community leaders, um, they need to, to be related to um, the, Muhammad's circle. Right? So the, one, of the, one of the responses, one of the theories after Muhammad died was, no, 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 they all have to be descendants of uh, the first uh, successor of, of Muhammad, Ali, right? Imam Ali. Imam being the title of 
good and spiritual and uh, temporal. So Imam Ali, uh, you know, they're his descendants. That was one of the groups, right? And there were several descendants, and one of the descendants, the twelfth descendant, the twelfth Imam, therefore, right? The, right? So here's a, this is a key person. There's a seventh one, there's a, and so on. But here's a key person because he, this, this uh, twelfth Imam descended from Imam Ali, who was from the circle of Muhammad, right? So you see, this is a kind of a descendant who was supposed to be both religious and political ruler. Well, he died when he was a child. He doesn't die, excuse me. He disappears. That's the tragedy. That he disappears, which means that, well, what happened, right? So the, the explanation is that he went away only to come back later to establish the perfect world. Sort of a messianic, messiah-like figure, uh, this twelfth imam. But so you have even these descendants who go away, and those who uh, those who will follow this idea that the twelfth imam from these descendants, uh, this genealogical line, the twelfth imam is the true imam, right? And he will come back, right? These are Shia, the Shia Muslims. So the Shia uh, Muslims follow this idea of, uh, you know, the Imams need to come from Ali. But there are seveners, Shias, those who follow, who think it's the seventh Imam who disappeared and he will come back. There are twelver Imams who say, no, no, it's the twelver, twelfth Imam who disappeared and he will come back. So there are branches within Shia. Islam is not one thing at all. Most of the Islam uh, Muslims are actually Sunni Muslims and they don't have, they don't follow this idea that... Uh, you know, it needs to be related by blood to Imam Ali and so on. And that's the majority of, of Muslims around the world. Shia is a smaller group. And within that there are seveners, twelver, and so on. Well, the twelver Shia, guess what? Becomes a dominant um, religion, um, in a way, ideology, in a way, culture in Persia, somewhere in the Middle Ages. You know? So that's why it's important. So, um, why is this important? Because here's the thing, when, when, when the one who is appointed, think of it, think of it like this, when the framers died, who will rule after the framers? You can say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? The constitution. That's the point. Because there is a program, right? But here there wasn't a program, right? The constitution, which was the Quran, is there. The traditions surrounding what Muhammad did and, and wrote and said are there, right? But what do they mean? They're not very, you know, they're not like, they're not a constitution like, like the US one, in the sense of they only deal with politics, they deal mostly with, well, with everything, human life, spirituality, God, and so on, you know. But think of it like a framework who, 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 who didn't write the constitution, but wrote philosophy, and which includes some political things. And, but we have to apply it because, you know, this is the model. The message comes from, it's the truth, you know. So, one of the models was the twelfth Imam. But if the model, you know, disappears, while he's gone, you know, this messianic figure, who's going to rule? Well, because there is a body of writings, which is the Quran, the, the holy book, right? And, and uh, some other body of, um, uh, of, uh, of laws and traditions which together form the Sharia, Uh, so there's a body of laws, basically, and, and writings that remain. But how do you know how to apply it? Well, in the U.S. we have the Constitutional Court, right? That's the Supreme Court. That's who are, you know, they're like little prophets who tell us what the Constitution means, and we all follow, right? Well, who say that they're wrong, they're right or wrong, right? But we have to uh, accept what they say. And, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to show you some parallels then. You know, that, that this is not hard to understand what, what, how this happens and how this works. Uh, so the same here, when after the 12th Imam, what developed was this theory that, well, obviously, those who study the law, the, the Islamic law will be the ones able to interpret it. Well, just like with the Constitutional Court, right? So it would be the ulema who are basically legal scholars. You know, uh, who we interpret it. So that's the background uh, that I want you to understand when we go to talk to Iran. 
So as we as we continue talking about Iran, now uh, an important moment in uh, uh, you know Iran's history is modernity, right? Uh, the various tensions between you know in the Middle East, most of it was under the Ottoman Empire, but then Ottoman Empire was crumbling, and in Iran there were different groups in around the turn of the century, 1900, trying to point towards different directions in of development, and all of them was modernizing, westernizing group, and they said we need a constitution, we need a sort of a constitutional regime, and so on. And they actually passed the constitution around 1905, 1909, and founded a constitutional monarchy, because Iran by this time has been a monarchy. Uh, however, in 1920s, there is a coup d'etat, there is a violent takeover of power by uh, General, General Reza Khan. Reza Khan Pahlavi. So basically this general takes power in 21 uh, by force, but then he basically crowns himself as uh, Shah. And Shah is uh, again a traditional name for ruler, monarch sort of a thing, right? Not constitutional monarch, however, sort of absolute monarch, autocrat, right? Um, <clears throat> so Reza Shah, uh, uh, Reza Shah Pahlavi um, will rule since from 21 until uh, 1941. Uh, in this time, the Middle East is under pressure, and even before that, from the colonial powers. Britain is very active in the Middle East, obviously. And during the war, the British force him out and uh, put he put in his son. His son, who was Mohammed Reza Shah Pahlavi, so basically almost the same name. So Shah Mohammed Reza Pahlavi, and he comes to power in forty-one. So war, World War Two with British support. World War Two um, ends, and uh, then there are different groups after World War Two. When you know you have this whole process of decolonization, you know Israel is formed. Uh, 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 Algeria, we talked about uh, some of these things, and so Iran is also formed, there's still a British influence, but it's its own state, but there are different groups here, still a monarch, but there are different political groups, and there are, there are parliament, there's elections, and so on. The, the three groups were, one was pro-Western, and this was the Shah. Uh, then one was pro-Soviet, because this is during the Cold War, uh, and then there was a nationalistic group, who wanted, well, you know, self-determination and so on. And guess what? The, in 51, it's the, are the, it's the nationalists who win power under um, Mossadegh. By the way, you have a whole textbook chapter on Iran on canvas, which I um, uh, invite you to read. Uh, it gives you this whole context and background and more information I can give you in the lecture. I want you to focus on what I give you in the lecture, right? Yeah, but read the textbook to understand. So Mossadegh is uh, elected PM in '51. The problem is he's a nationalist, and he wants to nationalize what oil. Oil at this point point is uh, obviously an important thing, uh, um, and there were British interests and American interests there who, well, wanted to control oil, and they did control oil with the help of the Shah, who they supported. Americans and the British supported the Shah. The nationalists, nationalist uh, uh, group, wanted to nationalize, to, to, to put, take control over their oil resources. And this is why in 1953, uh, the British and American Secret Services, CIA and MI5, organized a coup d'etat, by which they throw out the elected, the democratically elected Mossadegh, and strengthen the Shah. Strengthen the Shah. And the Shah was, again, pro-Western, so he introduced different reforms, you know, pro-women, uh, in the sense of, you know, <clears throat> certain, certain restraints were removed and so on. So he had all these liberalizing reforms, but he was also an autocrat. He was also an authoritarian ruler. Not totalitarian, because he didn't have an ideology. He was an authoritarian ruler who controlled all politics and everything. Nobody could remove him, and he tortured his enemies and threw them into jail and uh, persecution, and people revolted because you don't like to be pushed down, and, and they were killed. So he was a brutal dictator, basically, who got tremendously, tremendously rich, also him and his, his uh, 
encircle his uh, family. So that's the context. So you have a pro-Western ruler who, who gives the West uh, oil and so on, and a, a popular elected leader who is removed with external intervention. And by the way, what I'm telling you is not conspiracy theory, theories or whatever, which I would be uh, loath to do, but it's, you know, historical uh, fact. Um, and it's also important to understand the current regime. Well, this, the ruler becomes worse and worse, but he also he gets old and gets sick. So by the, by the 70s, he's, you know, he's on the brink of, you know, he's kind of nearing his end. And this is what happens in 1979. In 1979, you have the famous revolution. Now, we call it now Islamic revolution, but it wasn't Islamic. So, 1979 revolution was actually against this, you know, autocrat, this, this brutal, brutal dictator, the Shah, who did good things with, with some of these reforms, but also was brutal and, you know, his, his family corrupt and so on. Um, so why do we call it the Islamic Revolution? But the revolution was basically a popular revolution. It was the people stick with the dictator. Right? Remember, dictator. Uh, stick with the dictator, with an autocrat. Uh, so they, uh, they revolted. And all kinds of groups in the society, communists and socialists and nationalists and people who just were sick of oppression and, and also Islamists. And this is, the, this is not, well, namely followers of Khomeini. Khomeini was a religious uh, scholar, well, Ruhola, which is a religious title. Ruhola Khomeini was a religious scholar who opposed the regime since the 50s, but then he was participating in an uprising and then he was exiled, basically. So he lived in Iraq, uh, ironically, because then he would go to war with Iraq, um, against Iraq. Uh, so he lived in Iraq, he lived in France, and so on. So he became this sort of a religious and political leader in exile who wrote messages at home and you know kind of he became like a de Gaulle figure right someone uh, who, who the oppressed people can look at you know so obviously religion is at the heart of the Iranian society and always was right but this is one religious leader now what you have to understand about Islam is that you don't really have hierarchy in Islam it's not like there is a clear, you know, like in the Catholic Church, there is a clear hierarchy with, you know, uh, you know, the priests and bishops and the Pope, or uh, even in different other churches, you have a certain hierarchy, right? You know who is the boss and who is not the boss, right? Uh, and there is a clear chain of command. But not, not in Islam. Islam is very decentralized. And Shia is more centralized, but not even here, you know? So... It's not like he was some appointed, you know, big, big boss, right? But he kind of became a, a, a major figure, a major ruling figure. Think, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, think, uh, uh, you know, Gandhi, think, uh, you know. I'm just giving you, again, examples to, to understand that this is not so far-fetched, right? That someone becomes a, a, a leader of opinion, like Gandhi. Gandhi was a religious leader, most of all. He was religious. He was a religious, uh, he was a, a religious person. Who was religiously motivated, but that had implications in politics. That's Gandhi, uh, if you read his memoirs. Um, same here, well, in a different direction, however. Right? So this person, Khomeini, he, while he was away in exile, this is when, just like with Machiavelli, just like with uh, Thucydides, people, when, are, when they're thrown out from their position, they sit down and write. It's, um, so he wrote a, a, theory, a theory of government which is, we will call, Velayat Efaki. And again, you have information on this in your textbook. Velayat Efaki. Velayat Efaki is what? Is Khomeini's answer to the question, who should rule while the 12th Imam is gone? Who should rule after, until he comes back? Right? Who should rule until the legitimate religious political ruler is gone? Sort of a messiah figure. So, he, he, gives a, he gives basically, he writes a sort of a draft constitution in a way, it wasn't a constitution, but a draft political treatise or philosophy, right? By which he says, it should be the guardianship of the jurists, 
So basically, it should be a guardianship, meaning uh, people um, um, who uh, take the place of someone that is not there, right? Guardianship. A guardianship of jurists, meaning the, those people who know the law, the law scholars. So what was this? The ulema, remember? Right? The, in, in Islam, it's very important, you know, scholars are very important, those who know the Quran, right? And then there's some clerics, but then there's scholars, and scholars are very important because they know the, the law of, of, of God. So, they should be in charge until the Imam comes back. And that's how we should set up uh, the right society. Right? <clears throat> Think of these as sort of philosopher kings, right? Uh, in a way. Because they know the truth and they will implement it in the... They will explain it and implement it in the society. Right? So that's his theory. Now, when he comes back to Iran during the revolution, his group is the best organized, has... Uh, is big, has organ is organized, and takes power. And takes power quickly, and in a couple of years they eliminate all the enemies. Because this sort of ideology that he proposes is kind of a hard ideology, remember our discussion? So enemies are not acceptable. Uh, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. You know? Which is okay, right? But if I say I'm you know, kind of a godlike figure in which I actually know every single thing about every single thing, then you're wrong completely, and I'm right completely, absolutely, on every single thing. Right? Um, so Khomeini takes power with his group, and this is why it becomes an Islamic revolution because they confiscate in, in a way. Although you know they have been the, one of the strongest factions to, to start with. You know they have guns and everything. Right? So this is the the, the, the origin of the current today's ir, ir, Iran. So Iran, the Islamic, is actually called. The Islamic Republic of Iran. So it's a republic, meaning that it's, it's based on popular power, but it's also Islamic. Maybe, meaning that it's based on what? On Islam? No, wrong. On Shia Islam? No, wrong. On 12 Shia Islam? No, wrong. On Velayat e Fakih, which is an interpretation of a 12 Shia Islam. Okay, so that's very important to understand that they, they call it an Islamic state, but it's not, right? It's Khomeini's interpretation of what, of a 12 or Shia Islam, what should happen within the context of a 12 or Shia Islam, you know? It's not even Shia Islam, because there are other Shia groups who don't, you know, and there are many clerics in Iran today, and even then, who said, well, wait a minute, who is this Khomeini, what does he want, right? Why this, right? Because again, there's no clear hierarchy. But he had the think of Khomeini as a sort of a Che Guevara, as a sort of a Fidel Castro, as a sort of a Lenin or, or, or Mao, right? A person who comes in with an idea and, and political power together and then shapes a country, you know? Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, all these figures did that, you know? Um, so that's what he is. This is why the Islamic Republic of Iran and another document I posted on Canvas is a fragment of the Constitution. So read the preamble there to understand what I'm talking about. So you see that the Iranic, Islamic uh, uh, Republic uh, of Iran is based on three things. And the Constitution, which is you know, an actual document of Constitution, not what this guy wrote, is based on three things. One is Islam, but it's not Islam as I said, but it's Shia Islam, but it's not Shia Islam, it's Tower Shia. It's not Torah Shia, but it's Velayat e Fakih. And the second thing on which it is based is the 1979 revolution, which was popular, which was against uh, the Shah, and it was against the Americans and the Brits, because they considered that it's the same thing. The Shah, supported by Americans and Brits, it's all one. And whether it is, it's not, that's not the point. You have to understand why, what, what's the background. So, revolution, Islam, but not Islam, but this, will have Fakih. And a third pillar is Khomeini. Khomeini, just like Cuba is based on Fidel Castro, just like uh, USSR was based on Lenin, to a, a large degree, just like China was based on Mao, you know, the founders, founding fathers, right? The founding fathers that gave them a constitution, a direction, an ideology, a system, a state, a 
everything in one. So Khomeini himself was a revolutionary leader. So you'll see all th these three in the in the in the uh, in the constitution and also reflected in um, the political system and the state the way it's organized. So basically you'll see that you have two sources here of legitimacy. What is legitimacy? We will talk about legitimacy and authority in a, a little bit later. But legitimacy is what gives um, uh, you the right to rule, right? Where from this right to rule? Well, in a representative democracy, this is why this is not a liberal democracy. Because in a liberal democracy, we assume, I don't know to what degree this is true, but we assume that uh, political power has only one source. What is that? The will of the people. Now, of course, it's not completely this way because there's a constitution which actually frames the will of the people. And their will is actually, you know, given, uh, shaped by the options that are available and all that jazz. Um, but we assume that in a liberal democracy, legitimacy comes from popular mandate. Now, here there are two different sources of legitimacy, of course. One is popular. So, um, that this whole thing can be synthesized in, in two sources of legitimacy. One is popular, meaning that it's based on a popular revolution. In Islam, the people are very much respected, actually, and the people have a voice in religion. So the will of the people, right, is one, because it was against the dictator, the revolution. So the new republic will have to be expressive of the opposite of the dictator, which is the will of the people. Ironically, it doesn't turn out that way, but that's the ideology behind. So popular, and the other one is uh, Islam, or divine. But of course, not Islam, as I said, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. So there are two sources of legitimacy. Basically, God, not you know any God, right? But in a certain interpretation, right? Islam, not the uh, fakih rather, right? And the people. So these two sources of legitimacy, divine versus popular, are the sources of the Iranian state, Islamic and Republic. And all the institutions in the state will reflect this. So let's look at uh, the Iranian political system. So this is why it's not a liberal democracy. Because the legitimacy comes from different sources, not all of them corresponding to the usual source of legitimacy in a liberal democracy, which is the people. So here's the, very briefly the system. Well, at the top of the system is the leader who obviously initially was Khomeini. Now Khomeini died, they all died, in 89, if I'm not mistaken, and he was succeeded by another one, um, Khamenei. Khamenei is currently the leader since 89 or 90. But there's the leader, right? Uh, then there is a president, right? So there's a leader and there's a president. You see, there's a conflict already here. Then there's a parliament, yeah, parliament, yeah. Then there is another sort of an, almost like an upper house of the parliament. Yeah? And then there is another institution here, and another here. And in a second I'm going to explain what this is. So the leader basically is, well, the, what the name says, the leader. He is the person who, just like Khomeini, again, it's based on three things. Uh, Islam, meaning Valayat al-Fakih, people, Khomeini, revolution or people, a popular revolution, and Khomeini. This is the leader. Ex which source does he express? What, where, where does his legitimacy come from? Well, obviously, from the figure of Khomeini, who was a religious and political leader. So this leader will embody this sort of a religious political figure. But it's like, what will Cuba look like after Castro dies? What will whatever China look after Mao dies? It changes. So Khomeini is not Khomeini. How many? It's the leader of today, but you have it in the book. Anyway, the leader is the one who is who is there to continue the direction set by uh, uh, Khomeini. He is the one who shapes the grand direction of the country. He is the guardian that the country remains faithful to the to Islam, to the Quran, to the teachings of Muhammad. So he is there to guarantee 
the direction of this of this whole system. Sort of a president in a semi-presidential system like in France, but he's more than that. Right? So he, uh, but how do you become a leader? Well, guess what? He's elected for life, though. And it's only been once since Khomeini, right? So he's elected for life. Uh, so he determines the direction of the country, he determines the interests of Islam, uh, Islam, he sets the grand political directions, policy directions for the country. He appoints a tremendous amount of key positions in various bodies. So he has all these powers of appointment, powers of shaping policy, and he's also the commander-in-chief of the militias, of the uh, military, and so on. Then you have so a tremendous amount of sources of power, both formal, you know, being uh, you know, in charge with setting the policy, and informal, because he can appoint uh, you know, people to a tremendous amount of institutions, and it's always power, because they all depend on him. Uh, the president is basically the head of the executive. So it's almost like you have a president-prime minister relationship like in the French uh, political system. You know, the president, it's not quite like that, but you see the parallels. So the president is the head of the executive, he has a cabinet here, uh, and he is elected by the people directly every four years for two mandates only. So, you know, he is elected for only, he says, term limit. No term limit here. Yeah. So here's where, um, so he's a, he's a head of the executive, he needs to be Iranian, he needs to be Shiite, a 12 or Shiite, he needs to be male, and so on. But he's elected by the people <coughs> for two terms. And he runs the government, basically, right? As in a presidential system. This, this looks like a presidential system here. Then um, you have the parliament, which is called Midas, which is directly elected by the people for four years, you know? And it has all the powers of, uh, you know, legislation that you're used to have and so on. Um, Everybody votes. Uh, you have to be Muslim to get into the parliament. You don't have to be Shia, uh, but there are positions reserved for religious minorities and so on. Um, so it has the power to pass laws to govern the, the country, and can also it, it also uh, approves cabinet ministers. So you know powers of oversight, powers of uh, uh, the budget, powers of um, uh, legislation. So you know, but here's the here's the trick. If you have elections, well, isn't this dem democratic? Well, remember what you said, they need to be free and fair elections. Are they free and fair? Well, they're not in many ways. First of all, in order to become a candidate, you need to be approved. Both for the elections for the presidency and for the elections for the parliament. Approved by who? Here's uh, the other uh, institution that I want to get to. This is the Council of Guardians, or the Guardians Council. Council of Guardians. And these are 12 people, 6 are legal scholars, and 6 are religious scholars, religious legal scholars. So all of these are legal scholars, but these are deal with religious law, and this, these, these deal with the Constitution. So 12 people, guess what? The religious scholars are appointed by the leader, the legal scholars are appointed by the minister of... Um, uh, by the head of the judiciary, right? So, anyway, keep in mind that half of them are appointed directly by the leader. And these scholars check that all that happens in the system, it's like a constitutional court, okay? But they are the embodiment of the principle that I mentioned. What? Verate fakih, meaning what? Guardianship of the scholars, of the jurists. Well, these are the jurists who are the guardians, who are the guardians to check the entire system goes according to what is inscribed in the constitution, which is what? Islam, not Islam, you know, but Khomeini's interpretation of Islam, the will of the people, democratic, the way they understand it, but checked that it corresponds with religious law, right? And the, you know, the legacy of Khomeini, in a way, right? So they can check all laws, they can check all decisions in the system, if they correspond with those principles, with Islam, the Quran in that specific interpretation, Shia and so on, and uh, with the constitution of Iran, a sort of a constitutional court, but based on both sources of legitimacy. They also check candidates 
the candidates for the parliament and the candidates for presidential election. So here's the thing, right? There are checks on these elections. This, these are not free and fair elections. To, in addition, elections are often manipulated, not counted, right? Remember what you said about the criteria for being a free and fair election. So here what you have, it looks to a degree this democratic, because the elections, you know, actually the last elections were quite, quite free and fair. Besides the candidates being checked in, in, uh, beforehand, which is a given thing, thing, there was competition and they were actually, the results seemingly were counted correctly and everything. Um, <clears throat> so, the Council of Guardians. So what is this? This is the um, Assembly of Experts. Uh, these assembly of experts, again, uh, are elected for 10 years by the population and uh, they are all religious uh, scholars, yeah? This is why it's them who elect the leader, you know? Because they are elected, but they're also religious scholars and they need to pass an exam uh, administered by the Council of Guardians. So you see here how the leader and the Council of Guardians exercises a check on the whole system based on the principles that the system embodies, you know. Um, so, okay, and then you have this institution here, which is the Expediency Council, which was established not within the Constitution and with the Constitution, but later on to kind of manage the conflicts between this side and this side. Expediency Council. This is why it's called expediency to ex explain things. And the Expediency Council basically is our people who are from all the institutions of power in the country, from the military, from the government, from the parliament, from here, from here. They're here. So you see, it's basically a club of the most powerful people, governors of different uh, regions of Iran, and so on. So they, you see that the Expediency Council is a club of the most powerful people there. And get, guess what? they're all appointed by the leader. So it's basically a good way, which you'll see in many non-democratic countries, including Russia, that there are such institutions that are not democratic, but that but reunite all the power holders in the state. Think Middle Ages when their king needed the nobles, who were powerful in different areas, to rely on them to keep control of the territory. Well, kind of the same thing, kind of the same thing. But this bypasses the, remember, accountable government principle, the limited mandate principle, the accountability and popular mandate principle, right? Because they're all appointed and it's, they're the basis of the source of power of the leader. Now, if you look at this whole system, and by the way, you have a little drawing, a chart on canvas, which will illustrate exactly what I'm going to tell you now. Notice that I told you there are two sources of legitimacy. One is Islam, although it's not Islam, but Balat al Fakiks, but I just say Islam, and the other one is popular. There are two sources of legitimacy in this, in which the system is based, constitutionally. Well, notice that here's the dividing line. That these institutions have a popular mandate, even this one, partially. Maybe here the line is not drawn correctly because the experience comes out of some of these are elected. But basically, the system, the institutions, right? A system is institutions. Politics is made of institutions. The political system is made of institutions. And they are established based on certain principles. Well, notice how visible these principles are. That these people are established mostly reflect the Islam source of legitimacy, and they check the system to, that it corresponds to Islam, but not Islam again. Shia Islam, a specific interpretation, and all that. Which all the other, the rest of the world who is uh, Muslim doesn't agree with, by the way. So and a popular source of legitimacy. And obviously there's tension between them, which is why this institution was established. Because, you know, elected people will want, whenever you establish a uh, governmental institution, it will grab as much power as it can, it will assume as many responsibilities as it can. And the Mayanists even passed laws, attempted to pass laws, to limit the powers of the Council of Guardians, and then they were shut down. It's like Parliament, uh, Congress trying to limit the powers of the Supreme Court. Actually it can in the US, but it doesn't do it, yeah? But it tried and it was shut down, okay? So, <clears throat> besides this, you have military institutions, police institutions, um, paramilitary institutions, so you have all kinds of 
tools of power that are all connected to the leader. But it's not really the leader here, because you're going to say, well, let's just you know, remove the leader. It's not about the leader. The leader is no longer Khomeini, so it is not that sort of a personality. You know, Mao was Mao, Castro was, is Castro. It's not him who is in power. In, in fact, throughout these institutions, there are different circles of power. There are different, different groups that vie for influence. And for influence, of, uh, both in the system, but also economic influence. And economic influence because there are diff these uh, 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 foundations, these sort of non-governmental or quasi-para-statal organizations, which are not state organizations, but neither are they completely non-state, non non-governmental. And these are huge, huge institutions, like the foundations, Foundation for the Disinherited, Foundations for the Veterans of War, and the book, the book talks about them. All of these um, are huge, huge institutions which have businesses, run banks, employ people, tremendous amount of people, thousands and thousands of people get their livelihood from these parastatal organizations. Guess what? Their leaders are also connected are appointed by the leader. So there's this network of different groups of power who control different, who are throughout this system. And they're not on the same page. Now, let me back, get back here to the president, because this is a good moment to, to, to make this remark. Remember, I don't know if you remember, when Ahmadinejad was in all the news. Who was Ahmadinejad? Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. He was the president of Iran. And it was everywhere in the newspapers that the president of Iran said this and did, and he said this about, you know, whatever. And now you see that the president is literally not very important. You know, for people who don't understand politics, who don't have a knowledge, which you have, of political, of politics, which you have, you can say, wait a minute, right? You should tell them, wait a minute. What is, don't be fooled by the name, because the president of Germany, as you well know by now, is irrelevant, basically. He's just a symbol. So just because someone is called a president doesn't mean they're anything. I can be the president of my golf club, you know. Doesn't mean I can rule the country, right? The president here is just like a prime minister in, in France. He has some powers, right? But not like the leader and not like the, you know, this whole system. You have to understand how this whole system works. Because, so, Ahmadinejad, nobody talks about him anymore. Why? So, did he change his mind? No. He simply ran out of terms. There's a two-term limit for the president. Once he's gone, he's gone. He's in a, in a different institution here, by the way. This is how they rotate, you know. And that's another aspect. So anyway, looking over this whole system, free and fair elections, do we have them? Partially, right? Partially and not really free and fair. This is why there was this huge public uprising in 2008, right? Because they knew that the elections were stolen. Then we said rule of law. Do we have rule of law? Well, partially, right? There is a rule of law, but is this law democratic, right? But it's not necessarily what we would think democratic, but that's a different debate. And is the law always applied equally? No, because again, the system, although it looks kind of logical, it's actually run by connections between different groups of individuals. In different parts. So this, these connections between these individuals and these, um, these groups bypass the normal functioning of the political institutions. And that makes it, you know, not predictable, not accountable, as we would expect it to be. So rule of law, yes, there is a rule of law, although it's in the hands of the Council of Guardians, but, you know, kind of like a constitutional council, but it, it's undermined by all these connections, plus it's not democratic in the sense that you know, it's not based only on the Constitution, it's also based on the Rayat e Fakih and also based on uh, the Quran and so on, and a liberal democracy doesn't accept that most of the time. Um, right or wrong? Then, rule of law, well, not really there. The, so, then, do we have um, a limited and accountable government? Well, not really, right? Here's the thing. You have limited and accountable government here because Executive can be removed by the parliament, parliament gets voted in, so, you know, there's a popular check with limits, right, because the elections are not completely free. So there's some accountability, but not here, really, because the 
here most of the positions are pointed, are they? So not really, and is it limited? Not really. Um, the, and here it connects to the fourth element, which is what? Civil and political rights and liberties. Well, this is where it fails seriously, right? It fails seriously because, well, you, you, you're not free. You, know? you have certain freedoms, but not what we would consider to be the, the required freedoms and liberties and so on. Are we right to consider them freedoms that are needed and so on? That's a whole different discussion. But if we're looking at it from the perspective of liberal democracy, you don't see it. Yeah, you don't see it. Because you can participate in politics freely because there are limitations. Your candidacy has to be filtered and approved uh, according to certain criteria. Uh, there's an ideology behind this system that sets the limits of popular action. So although there are two sources of legitimacy, this one is checked by this one. And again, it's not Islam as other Muslims would have it. But it's clearly not completely popular legitimacy. It's an ideology that uh, uses these institutions of powers to control the functioning of the so-called popular dimension uh, to make sure it remains within the frames of the ideology. And this is why we can call it a liberal democracy. Free fair elections, partially. Civil and political rights and liberties, very little. Literally. Limited and accountable government, no. All these institutions of power, there are all these militias and, and power groups and um, you know, uh, guard, revolutionary guards who have an air force and a navy, you know, sort of, a, you know, not the military. There's a separate whole military structure who are equally powerful, almost like the military, have their own thing and you don't have the popular control over them. Do you remember civilian control of the military? Well, not really. Um, so you have all these institutions of power who are used to squash dissent. Yeah? Uh, and that's why well, it can be considered to be a liberal democracy, especially because of those uh, the lack of civil and political rights and, and liberties. It's, it's very clearly framed by the uh, ideology and the Government is not limited at all. It, it, it governs. Although, so the question being, you know, is this an authoritarian or a totalitarian regime? It's in between because you can have freedom of economic activity. Nobody stops you from opening a business. There are many aspects of your life where you can do whatever you want. You know, uh, you know, uh, sports and you know, daily whatever family, but. Um, it, so, you know, the state doesn't try to control really everything, but, uh, pol you know, politics is controlled. However, there is an intrusion also of the state of the ideology on these areas that I just mentioned. Maybe except the economy, you know, where it's, 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 you know, there's a sort of, you know, it's a free market, basically. Um, uh, so, it's in between authoritarian and totalitarian, but it's not totalitarian regime in the sense in which, you know, Albania or Cuba or Mao of China was. Okay, so this is a brief example of how a political system is not a liberal democracy and why it is not a liberal uh, democracy. Uh, and use the materials posted on Canvas to complement what I just told you to kind of have a maybe a richer uh, image, uh, what you didn't really understand here. You're free to email me as well. Uh, and on the overview, I'll uh, specify exactly what aspects I would like you to pay more attention to when, you know, on the, on the test. The next, uh, the next uh, video lecture will be on another example, case study of um, a non-democratic political system, meaning uh, China.